Okay, I've started the recording. This is our lecture for Design 350. Uh, we're looking at social data maps. Actually, we're looking at rental agreements and things like that. We're talking about leveling. Um, we're going to be going over some zones and talking about those because those go into into um, into uh, rental agreements and things like that. <laughs> so. Um, let's go ahead. I'm going to start first with, um, looking at, at level. Okay. And so I've got here and I'm going to do it in AutoCAD. Let me, um, just start a new one here and get myself set up. Like I said, I'm a little bit behind. That's okay. I'm working on VMware. So I have to change it every time. And I do that because I know you guys have to. I actually have a way where I don't have to, but that's okay. So what I want to talk about, we're talking about leveling the, um, the Adelite site so that you get a really, really good reading, right? Um, from, from the Jamboard, sorry, my desk is moving on me. From the Jamboard, we can see that this, this line has to be level, right? If it's, if it's not level, it's, it's not reading this height the same as this height, the same as this height. So these have to, this has to be level to the world, okay? Now, granted, the world is curved, and if you go miles away, we actually have ways to take account of that uh, with real big dog surveyors. If you're looking out, you know, you know, a thousand feet or a couple of thousand feet, and you have to be super, super precise, they, they actually account for the curvature of the world and and do that. We're not. We're not. We're just going to make sure that that's, that that's level. But one of the things that you'll see in the... Um, now I'm going to go over to the discussions. Oops, I'm still in student view. See if anybody has their data in here yet. We've got a set of readings. They've got their readings. Dang it, that's not what I asked for. Um, see how I said upload the images? That's really what I want. I mean, I can take this, but darn it, I wish people would give me exactly what I was asking for. Now I have to go look at it somewhere else. Uh, 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 um, here we go. I really want the images. So here's one where I can kind of see it. Okay, see this image right here? That's your vertical. And it says whether you're, whether you're really level or not. And this one's not. It's like 91 degrees instead of 90 degrees. Okay, of course, we weren't working at it when we were working on this one. Uh, we really need these to be level. Or this doesn't work. And let's see how much it doesn't work. I'm going to draw a line. And I'm going to put myself into decimal feet. And I'm going to look at my degrees pretty close decimal degrees so let me draw something that's 100 feet long and i'm going to do a copy rotate rotate that this spot and i'm going to move it one degree oops i should have kept the old one in there Uh, 
Okay, so the trick is, how far am I off? It doesn't look like that much. Okay, let's, let's find out. D-I-S-T. Well, I'm off by 1.7 feet. <laughs> well, that was kind of, that was kind of not good. But I can get closer than that pretty easily. I can get closer. So let me, let me rotate this. Let me say it's half a degree. Copy. So there's half a degree. And of course, that's probably going to be off by about half as much. 0.8. Well, let's try a quarter of a degree. Now we're starting to get down there, right? When we look at this. Let's go with a tenth of a degree. 0.1 degree. Well, these are these are in minutes. Degrees, minutes, seconds. Um, so 10. Let me change this. Let me come back and do my do my thing differently. It should be a rotate command. You guys all know the rotate command that you can pick a spot, pick where you go about, and then you can say type C for make a copy. Let me go 0D 10 minutes. Okay, so that's being off by this amount. I'm off by a whole degree on this one, but let me go 10 minutes. Let's say I'm off by 10 minutes. How much will I be off here? 0.3 feet. 0.3 feet. Okay, that's that's four inches. So so I'd be off by my elevation fair fair amount. Let's see what my next one is here. If those are 10 degrees and that gap right there is one minute. So if I could get this 90 to move over in between these two zeros, I'll be within one minute. Let's see what one minute is. Rotate. Copy. And I'm going to go 0D, 0 minutes. And what, what, what did I say that was? 10 seconds? So that gap was 10 seconds. Oh, now I'm getting pretty good here. That was 10 seconds. 0.04. That's 0 .04, 0 0.04 feet. Okay, that's getting pretty close. That's kind of cool. Degrees, minutes, and seconds. So I need to get this to really get a good reading. I need to get my 90 marker in between the two zeros, right? The zero mark and zero mark. Then I'm getting really close. Okay. Otherwise, I'm otherwise I'm I'm off by quite a bit.
Okay, does that make sense, Eric? That why we want to get that so good? Oh yeah, I mean yep. yeah, especially over any kind of distance for sure. Right. So now let's go ahead and do this. Let's do a, a lengthen command to a total of five hundred feet, which is not uncommon, right? What we're gonna do is almost always gonna be in one or two hundred feet. Now my one degree. Oh my gosh. I'm off by so much. Eight feet. One point four feet. Point oh two feet. Let's see what that turns out to be. 0. 0.02 times 12. That's that's still a quarter of an inch. You know, over five feet, I'm off by a quarter of an inch. Okay, so now really that gap was 10 minutes wide. I really want to get it into the center so that I'm off by maybe, sorry, seconds wide. I want to be off by like five seconds, which would cut that in half, right? Five seconds would cut that in half, so an eighth of an inch. So, so you really, really, really want to get that good. And there are tricks that you do to get it level, perfectly, perfectly level, that we're not going to go over. You know, 500 feet away, a quarter of an inch for us, doing bulldozing or trying to figure out the height of a building, that's okay for us, okay? Uh, we're not going to be, be worrying about that so much. I just want you guys to know how critical that that can be, okay? It can really, really, really be critical. So there's our little demonstration of it. You're not required to draw this or do anything with it. I just want you to know that when we look at our readings that this vertical is how level your line of sight is and we want that 90 pegged right in that zero make that bigger so we can see it thought i can make it bigger I guess I can't. I don't know where my zoom is on here. That's kind of weird. Cheapo Microsoft tool. Okay. All right. So now let's go ahead. I, the next thing I want to talk about. Close these all down. Open it up like 20 times. The next thing I want to talk about is a little bit about our rental agreements and required to conclude disclosures and rent control. Uh, and these have to do with, you know, owning a piece of property and letting somebody else live in it. And as you know, um, huge portions of California are zoned <coughs> RD1 rental uh, sorry residential one and so to rent one of those out you're renting a whole house out to somebody but with sb9 and sb10 <clears throat> um, starting in january property owners will have the ability to either create duplex on their lot or split their lot and put two duplexes on, or go with the um, accessory building, granny flat, tiny house, um, with near sure approval of the planning department. The planning department still has to check that there is enough electricity on the site, 
enough gas to the site, enough water to the site, so and enough sewage from the site. So those things still have to meet certain requirements. Most developments have that already. Um, for instance, my house, I've got enough for almost double the sewage load because we increased our size to four inch when they um, when they put um, a second story on years and years and years ago. So many places do have that. So we're going to talk about rental agreements, but first, before we do that, I want to look at um, county planning. You guys should have this one. Get this ingrained in your brain. Okay. And then we can come here and we can look at the zoning code. So they've been working on making things more and better. Land use regulation document. So here's the zoning code. And we can look at zoning districts and use regulations. Those are the two things that we want to look at most. So we can find zoning districts, but right now I want to look at use regulations. And you're going to find, oh my gosh, look at all this stuff. So we're interested RD1, RD2. That is where we're at, where Residential 1 has been changed essentially to Residential 2. You can have two um, residential units on a lot. Okay, and so what can you do on it? Well, you can do non-commercial beekeeping. That's interesting. You can do stables and corrals. They're permitted if you have enough property. Okay, you can do all these kind of little things, urban agricultural stands. So these depend on how much property you've got. But this is a great one to go through. Allowed uses, allowed uses, allowed uses. You can make a little lake or a pond. Ah, dwelling, single family, attached. Okay, what is UPZ? Conditional use permit by the zoning administrator. So that means that you can get a conditional use to put on a single, a, a, an attached single family. That's where or RD1 or RD2, that that's now essentially yes. That has been made yes. Single family detached. Yes, you can do that. Family daycare. Yes. Mobile home manufactured home. Yes. So these are all acceptable uses on residential one or residential two and since residential two is allowing a second one to be come on we're allowed to put a mobile home or a manufactured home or a tiny home on without needing any further zoning now residential care home condominium conversions those are not necessarily going to be allowed. Places of worship, private social center, college or, uh, college or university. Isn't that interesting? Because some of these residential places are zoned. They're, they're an acre, two acres, three acres, four acres. And people want to be able to do these things on their property. Isn't this weird what all you can do? Community garden. There you go. That's a cool one. It's allowed. Period. So if you've got, let's say you've got a half acre lot and you've got a small um, 
a small residence on it and you go, I want to make a community garden. You're allowed to. Isn't that cool? A little public park, you can do that. Now, a market where you sell stuff is UPM. You, you have to get a minor use permit. And so that you'd probably have to say your hours and when you're going to sell stuff. We've got one of those not far from me. A guy puts out on on some little shelves outside of his outside of his home and it's on a green belt near the golf course. He's got like six shelves outside of his house and you can just go up and walk up and get a potted plant, a cactus, a tomato, you can do all sorts of stuff. He's got a QR code that says please Venmo me four bucks or two bucks or whatever. And so he got a permit to do a market garden. Um, and so all of these things are a lot now, you know, hopefully you're not going to put those on social rehabilitation center might be nice. Now, what does that do for our tiny house for foster care? UPP conditional use permit. So if we wanted to take a site that was an acre, <clears throat> RD1 can go down to a quarter acre. We could split that into two lots and put two duplexes on it. And one of those duplexes could have, say, two bedrooms. So we could get like eight bedrooms out of this place. And we could say, um, we're going to rent these to foster youth who have timed out of the system. We're going to make it cheap. Da, da, dum. And you could take that to a conditional use permit. Now, <clears throat> There'd be things like, are there services? There's all sorts of things that we can look through here, but that would probably um, fall under that. <clears throat> Major utility. That's really interesting. P-U-Z, conditional use permit. What would the major utility be? You might want to put a microgrid in place or a cell phone tower on your property. All of these things could be done. I'm not sure what the difference between a major and a minor utility is. We'd have to go look those up. Small wind turbine, UPM, minor use permit. You can put a wind turbine up, maybe. Oh, here's the wireless communication facility. So that one is UPP. Conditional use permit. Okay. And all you have to do is show that somebody else has got one near you. You're okay. Um, small cell. So these are all cool things. This tells you if all of these things are allowed or not. Animal and pet services. That's kind of cool. If you want to have a place that, um, you know, a small kennel or a dog grooming. Or uh, a dog selfie station. You can do that. All of these things are called out. And these are RD1 and RD2. And it lets you know what's allowed in certain places. Okay. So like, you know, these aren't allowed in the, in the residential area. Now you might, if you want to do one, you'd have to go get. A, um, a, a rezoning on your property to go into a mixed use. Okay, so you could say, hey, I've got some space. I've got some room. Uh, I'm going to do a barber shop. I'm going to use one room in my home. And can you give me a mixed use uh, variance? And they'll charge you a thousand bucks or something. And and maybe they'll let you do it. Okay, so these don't, because it's blank, doesn't mean you can never do it. It means that you actually have to, um, you actually have to rezone that lot and, and make a, a case for it. So these are all kind of cool things. Um, so like, like some of these now, they've just made a law 
that says you're allowed to do ghost kitchens. I think there's also a new law that you can use a residential site. You know what a ghost kitchen is? That's where it's basically a door dash. You're a, you're a kitchen. You do less than 20 orders per day using your at-home facilities. You do have to show that you've got a health certificate and you've got like a serve safe certification and you can just cook stuff and do tw up to 20 orders a day. And it's usually, it's really set up for Uber Eats and DoorDash, but local people can come and do a pickup so long as they don't enter the facility. So those are kind of cool. Ghost kitchens are a really neat uh, business that's popping up all over the place because they've made them legal. Uh, so that's really cool. Uh, so, uh-oh, adult businesses. Okay, those are not allowed in residential areas. Uh, you can imagine that those are not allowed um, in residential areas. So you can go through here, and each county really has something like this to see if you get... you Look at that. You can do a UPZ. Conditional use permit. What is that? That's an Airbnb. You just have to get a permit for it. Not bad. Uh, the problem comes is if you're trying to do it without paying your, your taxes and your business license and your business taxes. That's a problem. You're putting a load on the community, and so you should go ahead and pay your, pay your taxes on that. But that's what really these lodging uses are. Um, these are kind of cool, right? And you can just look through here. And so these are all the zoning. And so when you look up on your SAC planning and find out what that zoning is, you can, you can look and see what's allowed automatically. Now, you still need to go get a permit if you're going to do building uh, of certain types. Um, if you're going to do anything with utilities, if you're going to put up a structure, certain structures don't need permits. Walkways, driveways, fences, of, uh, if you're following the, the, the local guidelines for, you know, the building codes. Certain things do not need permits. Most things do, and they're going to charge you for it. And that's just, that's just how projects go. So, look, we're only through page 17 of 32. Okay, then you've got the actual real stuff about it. So that's how you use the, this zoning guide. And it, it's really, really good. So as you do a project, if you're doing anything that's just like, not just plain Jane, right? Uh, if you're going to put up a gazebo, you probably need a permit uh, just for the structure, but you're not going to need to worry about that. If you put in a swimming pool, you just need a permit. There's nothing. There are all those types of things are permitted in the residential building code of RD1. But the important thing for our class is that we're going to be looking at RD1 is becoming RD2. So what do we want to do with that site? And we're going to be looking at that later on. And you can imagine the landscape opportunities, the uh, shared utility and microgrid opportunities. You're really opening up a lot of stuff integrate what's going to happen and here's the big thing about it there are many many people that live in rather wealthy rd1 areas that would like to affirmatively further fair housing and they get blocked all the time by their planning council um and so this will allow people that want to do this to to work on it and I'll tell you the planning council should be going yippee yay okay because they can say now 
that people are doing it. So as an example, that lot on Winding Way is like a little over an acre. And that could be split into two lots now, according to SB9. And each lot could have a duplex. Okay, And each duplex can have poof, two, three, four bedrooms in it. Okay, so just think what could be done with that one lot. And it could have a community garden, and it could have all sorts of stuff. It's really an ideal setup for doing an expansion of some things. And then we'll talk about CCNRs and things like that that will make it sustainable and make it pay for, set for itself as it's moving forward. Uh, the one thing that's required on this uh, SB9 is that the owner must be in residence for something like two or three years. Now, we know people get around that all the time, um, but, but it's still got some good legs behind it, and it should help out. Okay, any questions on, on reading this zoning codes and what they are? Cool. And, and look, if we want to, um, these use standards, here's how I would use one. If I want to know about this mobile manufactured home, I can highlight the use code, control F, 3.5.1.G. And it goes right to it. Isn't this the coolest thing? So this is this is one of those things where um, in that in that course it's going to start on that reading course. This is one of the things that will happen. Uh, okay, find out about mobile manufactured homes. It's permitted as a primary residence or accessory. Not less than ten acres at the time. RD. must be placed on a permanent foundation that can be post and pier, meet the building with requirements and architectural standards. So that is really cool. Okay, so that means that you can build one and, and these width standards, I think it has to be at least eight foot wide and things like that. There's some width. Now, it can be a temporary. Let's look this one up. Three. There's the first one. Here we go. Here it is. Go there. Temporary uses. Residential. Blah, blah, blah. Well, they're saying you can, this one. It says it's being constructed or remodeled. Ah, for persons in need of care or supervision. So that would go with the foster youth. There we go. Close care supervision in any zoning district with a primary established residential use. Right there. Cool. Okay. Guidelines for placement. Construct. So this really is is in essence it's really going to ask asking to be used in other temporary conditions. 
we probably wouldn't really want to go into that one much. Okay, it's better to go with the uh, SB9 version of what's going on. Okay, so I wanted to go over that. The next thing I want to do is look at rental agreements. Okay, and and if you are going to rent out a place, you need to be knowledgeable about it. So you can't just go, oh, I'm going to I'm going to do this and it'll be great and I'm going to help people and all this kind of stuff, okay? So a rental is really a contract. Um many areas of California have master contracts that you must meet. Like they have to be for a certain amount of time, often a year. If it's month to month, there are certain conditions, um, things like that. And when you make your contract, there's certain things that you must do. You have to talk about security deposits. How they're going to hold it, how long they're going to hold it, how long it takes to give it back. Uh, are there non-refundable fees? They're not always permitted. Okay. Is there a move-in checklist for existing damages? That should be standardized. Um, they can be at a move-out inspection. Um, there sh you need to know what the landlord, tenant, rent control laws are in the local area. You're not supposed to go figure that out as a renter. The rentor is supposed to give it to you and see the 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 landlord um you know oh they're supposed to give you are there any registered sexual offenders databases that show anybody nearby shared utility arrangements so these are all things that you think about um as a renter and so as a landlord you need to think about these things too um and and they also drive partly your decisions on the the size, the scope, how many people you're going to rent to. And these are all also driven by the fair housing um, requirement. You don't get to pick who you're going to do to unless you have an agreement with an agency. Okay, so. If you have an agreement with an agency that uh, they get to provide, um, you know, renters and that that's what you're going to do, that's okay. But otherwise, you can't say, and I'm only going to rent to foster youth or I'm only going to rent to certain people or I'm only going to rent to other people. Okay? You're, you're just not allowed to do that. Now, you can... You can advertise to certain populations to make sure that that's the, the direction you're going. And you can enroll in programs that are vetted to assist and help um, protected categories of people. So that you can do. Otherwise, this is about it. You have to do these things. And um, you need to know know what they are in your state. So these are all kind of cool things to know about, and and you know they're trying to get they're trying to get you to hire them on this site. But these are good things to just start thinking about as you're doing this. What would happen if I used SB nine and I made a duplex or I put another thing on. What restrictions am I going to try to put on? And what do I have to let people know about? What don't I have to know about? What am I allowed to do? So uh, this is about landlord disclosures. And you really need to tell people about them. It doesn't really say anything about uh, use of the property. Why do you think that is? Why can't you say, and you can only use this for a certain amount of time and da, 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 and blah, 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 and you have to, you know, it's not allowed. 
can't tell people when you're renting to them how to use the property if it is a standard rental agreement. If it's a short-term support agreement, you can do a few things. If it's an Airbnb, there's a few other things that you can do. Okay. And so I just want to look at rent control a little bit. And so these are some good sites. What are you allowed to do to screen people? You are allowed to do credit worthiness. Right? You're, you're allowed to check and see if somebody is credit worthy to, to rent your property. But you have to be clear and un, upfront of what credit worthiness rules you've got and how you're going to check and what you're going to check. And if you only check things that um, discriminate against people, you're not allowed to do that, okay? What can you do if there's late fees? Um, how about security deposits? What's allowed, what's not allowed? Types of rentals not covered by tenant law. That would probably be a really good one to look at. I didn't even look at this one yet. Floating home residency law. Wow, that's an interesting one. Civil code. Oh, transient occupancy hotel, residence club. Okay, so... So you can see whether you fall into these, whether you fall into these, whether you fall into these. Well, you're not a floating home. Mobile home residency laws. So I just like you to poke around and see what's there. I'm not asking you to look and see what they all are. I want you to go, oh, okay, I kind of I kind of get what's going on and and see what's up with this. Sort of like Hit the headlines. Okay, so. Change of use, resident, tenancy, state-owned parks, direct your notice, rental agreement, blah, blah, blah. These things are all set out. Rules and regulations. Management of entry. Meant who can amend the rules. Zoning and use permit during lease. Wow, this is all sorts of stuff. Guest and living care providers. Man, tons and tons of stuff. I'm going to put this one on there. That one looks like a good one to be able to um, add on to. So the whole purpose behind this is to become somewhat knowledgeable about what's going to affect our projects in the second half of the class. Okay? Uh, let's look and see how those are going to filter into your template. I think I've got a 3K plus for you to do on this. Okay, so remember, what did you already know? What what did you already know about rental agreements, rental control? Many of you might have already been through these. Find a bunch of those keywords. Right? What are some of those keywords out of all those things that we were just looking at? And then what are you going to keep from all of this? And then give me your word cloud or something like that. And give me lots of links. I'm hoping that you guys can really come up with a bunch of good links that we can use. So that's what today was really all about. It's getting set up on, on this one right here. This is a great, great practice, by the way. I'm teaching it to you because it's a really, really good way as you get into a new project to just really get your background. 
I'll give you my, my best example of it. Uh, my first job out of college was to write a training, a proposal. Um, this was before I got the full-time job. This company needed help, and they wanted a proposal for um, a nuclear reactor maintenance project. And so, um, there we go. I, I was on just to help, you know, do drawings and research stuff and put it together and double check all of the presentations. And my boss, Lawson Null, who actually is a rocket science scientist, by the way, was going to do this presentation and General Electric was bringing their group in. This was about a $4 million job. Well, at the time... The company made about a million dollars a year. So you can imagine how important this job was. And it was to cut pipes on the jet pump risers and all this kind of stuff. And um, so I put the presentation together. And um, come the day of the thing, you know, I did the grunt work of putting the presentation together. Come the day of the thing, my boss shows up just horribly sick can't talk laryngitis his head is stuffed looks like crap and the big wigs from GE are coming in so he looks at me and he writes down on his little pad of paper you're doing you're doing the presentation and like oh my gosh yeah I'm just right out of school right I don't know anything about nuclear reactors well I do because I did all this stuff Every time I found a term I didn't know, I wrote it down. I wrote down my keywords. I had all my specs together. I got my notes out and I started the presentation and they started talking to me about the jet pump risers and the size and the ink canal and the types of preps. And, and I just said up front, I go, okay, I'm the junior guy on the team. I'm giving you the demo. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm always going to look at my boss over there, and if I say something wrong, he's going to nod it. He's going to shake his head, and and we'll get the real stuff. But I'm going to do my best. And and I went through it, and he only shook his head twice out of that whole four freaking hour presentation. And they were all over us. And what is your equipment like? I have no clue what our equipment was like for reals. But I had everything because I wrote down stuff and I used this system. I wrote down what I already knew and I always tried to go there with my answers. What did I already know? And if they were using stuff, I was looking up my keywords and I actually went backwards to find out what I already knew. And these were high level people. They were just looking at our stuff and we had a really, really good technical presentation but this type of organization saved me and and you can imagine this was in this was in 1983 we didn't have the computers and the well we had some computers but we didn't have the hyperlinks and all this kind of stuff we were pulling up powerpoint hardly even powerpoint we didn't even have powerpoint we were pulling out slides <laughs> It was like, oh my gosh, we had them all arranged. It was all good. We're pulling up actually slides and pulling out sheets of, of, of stuff. And we had examples of our equipment organized, organized, organized. So that's why, that's why I believe in this system so strongly. Okay, any questions before we log this one off? Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and...